I'm going to just bring you a message today where, uh, I mean, I'm just going to come straight at you today, okay? Can I just bring the, the meat, potatoes, and, and just come straight at you? Because this message has got, uh, ju you just need to get a little more, uh, what I say, like more into it, like more forceful, more uh, almost violent, okay? <laughs> but uh, <coughs> there. I remember uh, it's about advancing the kingdom, and I'm going to share eight ways to advance the kingdom of God in a violent world, and that's that's what it is today. Is I don't want to share that with you, but first, uh, uh, there we were, there we were. It was Game Seven. I'm not kidding. Game Seven of the Western Conference Stanley Cup playoffs. Game Seven, and we had tickets. It was uh, my sons and myself. We had tickets, and man, there was excitement in the air for Game 7. We had great seats. I mean, we paid big time, but we had great seats. We were all the way in the lower level, and we were just above the glass, maybe about 14, 15 rows up from the ice. It was, it was really good. We were right by the goal line, and, and that's where we were. And it, have you ever heard uh, that saying, I went to a fight and a hockey game broke out? Have you ever heard that? Well, you would know why if you, if you went in to a Red Wings game when they played at Joe Louis Arena. That was their home. Joe Louis Arena, the great boxer. And it, it was kind of a rough place to be, uh, not just for the opposing team, but for the fans too, including my one son who almost got TKO'd uh, by a slap shot that just went above the glass and hit him straight on in the face. And it was, the game was back and forth. And, and uh, the crowd was so loud that, you know, they couldn't hear you scream. It was almost like being in space. And uh, both teams were fighting for the puck and the right to advance to the Stanley Cup Finals. Everything was on the line. And I remember it was a great game because the Wings won that game. My son, who got hit by the puck, fought against the pain, and, and, and he won in that degree. And, and I fought for the puck. And I won. And, and so he, he's, that puck's sitting at his house right now. But I thought I'd share that with you because that's one of the sports I think is more violent than most. And to advance the kingdom, you got to be forceful. Matthew eleven twelve says this. Jesus said, and from the time John the Baptist began preaching until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully ad advancing. And violent people are attacking it. So I'm just going to give you the eight ways to advance the kingdom in a violent world. And, and, and I just led to, to bring this to you because the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and violent people are attacking it. You might relate to that a little bit more today than you could last year. With everything going on in the country and... You know what? All you got to do is turn one of these hockey teams loose in, in one of those towns, Seattle or Portland, wherever. It'll, it'll clean it up pretty quick. <laughs> but the first thing, the first thing that we have to do is we have to follow God's vision. Acts 26, 19 and 20 says, And so, King Agrippa, I obeyed that vision from heaven. I preached the f first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all Judea, and also to the Gentiles that all must repent of their sins and turn to God and prove that they have changed by the good things they do. Now, that's not holding anything back right there, is it? You know, John the, John the Baptist didn't hold anything back. Paul didn't either. He didn't hold anything back. So the vision, though, is a must in advancing the kingdom of God. Paul didn't think people would listen to his testimony as, you know, after all, he was the number one enemy of the church. Enemy number one. Why would you listen to him? But the kingdom of God is advancing forcefully and we need people that will take the authority and go forth in that way. But because Paul followed the vision, many churches were planted. Many churches were planted all over in that area. Paul had multiple visions, too. He, he, one was he was praying in the temple one day, and, and the Lord just told him, hey, get your stuff, pick up and go. You, you, I want you to get out of here because they're going to hurt you. 
And I want you to go to the Gentiles and start preaching to them right now. And then another one, he had another vision. Uh, he was held back from going into a certain area. And then he had a vision of a man in Macedonia saying, hey, come on over here. Come on over here and come and preach the gospel to us. And those visions really helped direct Paul go in that direction. Peter had a vision too. A lot of things wouldn't have happened at all with Peter. He was so stuck in the tradition and, and the Jewish culture and all that, that God had to give him a vision too. God told him to break the ceremonial law that forbids Jews to eat with Gentiles, even unclean food, to just forget about all that. Don't worry about that. That's not important. That's not important at all. It's just your tradition. And Peter obeyed the vision and ministered the good news to Cornelius and his whole household got saved. I mean, think about it. Following God's vision. You know, visions are supernatural. They're like supernatural Zoom, but, you know, it, they work actually all the time. And, and they're tools that God uses to show us things, show us direction. And they help us break through the, into a new territory to advance his kingdom. And the question isn't, has God ever given you a vision? The real question comes in with, if God does give you a vision, will you follow it? Will you follow it? So that's one of the big ways right there, starting off the bat, follow God's vision if you want to advance the kingdom of God in a violent world. The second one is accept angelic assistance. Now, there have been many breakthroughs and victories because of angels' interventions. Angels help deliver God's people to advance the kingdom and also to pour out judgment upon the kingdom's enemies. Think about it. King Herod, the, the king who was, who was there in Jerusalem and who put James, uh, the brother of John, to death and was, was going to kill uh, Paul or, or Peter and the rest of them, the angel showed up and struck him, and he died. And the kingdom of God grew and multiplied, it says, after King Herod was removed. Acts 5, 18 says, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people the full message of this new life. Now think about that. Not only did an angel bust, bust the apostles out of jail that, that evening, they... He, the angel also helped them evangelize to get the word of God out. And that's not uncommon for angels to do. Angels do help and play a part in evangelism at times. An angel directed Philip to go to Gaza to share the good news. And guess who Philip ran into? A very, very influential Ethiopian guy. And that Ethiopian guy was saved and baptized, and he went back to Ethiopia and he spread the good news there. And Ethiopia became one of the first nations, one of the first colonies of the kingdom of God. That's what happened. And, and an angel appeared to Cornelius too. The guy wasn't even saved, but he was praying and he was fasting. And an angel directed him to find Peter to hear the good news and how to be saved. Can you imagine that? And an angel appeared to Paul to encourage him and let him know that he wasn't going to die in the shipwreck and neither was any of the crew. And the angel actually told him, Paul, you are going to go to Rome because God has an assignment for you and you're going to testify in front of Caesar. And not only that, but everyone on this ship, God has given their lives to you. That meant to give them the gospel. And you wonder why Paul had favor with the Roman soldiers, you know, right up to the time of his, his trial. That's how the kingdom of God is advanced in violent, in a violent world. See, we don't fight against flesh and blood. You guys know that. Uh, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. That's not our enemies. People aren't our enemies. But against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Man, it looks like we're outmatched, right? Well, I'm all right with God sending a few angels to help even the score. Amen. 
I'm okay with that. I'll accept angelic assistance. As long as it's from the Lord, I don't mind at all. And so I'm all right with that. But that's a big way to advance the kingdom of God in a violent world. The third thing is, is we need to develop a habit of giving. Acts 20, 35 says, by everything I did, I showed how you should work to help everyone who is weak. Remember that our Lord Jesus said, more blessings come from giving than from receiving. More blessings come from giving than receiving. When we come under the ruler, the rule of the king, we come under the Jehovah Jireh rule, the Yahweh Uriah, the Lord our provider. The spirit of poverty can be cast out and, and thrown out and not have any power in the kingdom you're in. He can be cast right out. The spirit of poverty can be gone when we put ourselves under the rulership of the Lord who is our provider. Now, the kingdom advances through giving. Now, some people don't realize that, but the kingdom of God advances. You, you need you need a method, you need a man, and you need money. The three M's to advance the kingdom of God. And, and God uses money. God owns it all anyway. Amen. He owns it all anyway. Giving results in more people coming to the Lord. How many people have come into the kingdom of God by planting churches through this church? Uh, where are we at? About 60 or so right now? 60 some churches. Imagine how many lives that's touching in these other countries. You you know, we, we got we to gotta develop that habit and to give. And you can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. Giving is the, is the manifestation of the kingdom of God in you. You just want to give. Well, you want to give. Giving your time, your talents, your treasures. Uh, we're required to give all three of those. The kingdom is based on giving. It's the literal foundation of the kingdom is God gave his son. The son gave his life. Both the father and the son gave the Holy Spirit. And when Jesus ascended, guess what he did? He kept on giving. He gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And then the Holy Spirit gives us gifts. Every believer gets at least one gift. The Holy Spirit will give you at least one gift. So the Lord is a giver. God is a giver. There is no lack in the kingdom. Why is that? Because he owns it all. He owns it all. All that money that Rockefeller had before he passed, and he's got dead and gone now, that's still out there. Guess who owns it? The Lord. The Lord does. All that, what, you know, you look at what, what Bill Gates and all these other people make, don't worry. You know, don't, don't look at that like you covet it. The Lord owns it. And if you give, guess what? He'll funnel some of that your way. God gives you more than enough so that you can share with others. You know, when you, know when you don't have enough is when you stop sharing. That's, that's what happens. But God is a giver. And if we give, if we develop the habit of giving, it's a great way. It's a great way to advance the kingdom of God in a violent world. The fourth thing is demonstrating the authority of the king. Demonstrating the authority. Mark 16, 15 uh, go, goes into Jesus. He's ready to go to heaven. He's ready to ascend to heaven. He's got one more thing. He's given the, the disciples the commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it by no means will hurt them. And they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So then after the Lord has spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them in confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Now, who is, who's the signs follow? Those who believe, right? Those who believe. Jesus came to restore the kingdom. Restore the kingdom authority to men and, and save people. That's just saving people. 
and also to demonstrate his dominion of the kingdom over the devil. And that's destroying the works of the devil. So he came to save. He came to destroy the works of the devil. So the very beginning of the Lord's ministry started off with him preaching the good news of the kingdom. And what did that look like? Proclaim freedom, set the oppressed free, heal the sick and the lame, cast out demons. How can this happen? How, how can it happen? Well, it can happen because Jesus has all authority. He has all the authority. He wants the church to walk in that authority. He really does. In my name. You know what that means? In the name of Jesus, that means in the authority that Jesus has given us. In his authority. And I tell you what, he wants us to walk in the authority. And I've been blessed to see the Lord's authority over the devil uh, quite a few times. I mean, it is something to see the Lord just, just work. And, and I tell you what, sometimes it looks a little violent. But it's all right because the, the good guys win. Amen. We are part of his ministry. Amen. We are part. Even before all the, uh, the first 12 disciples were really following him, he was delivering people. That's what was happening. And, 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 but here's the thing. You got to step out. You got to step out. It says they went out. That's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Verse 20. They went out and preached everywhere. And the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Now, you have to step out. And stepping out is not always fun. Stepping out is something that might give you a little bit of fear, but you got to step out. When Jesus started his ministry, he read from Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news. And guess what happened? Signs and wonders followed the preaching of the good news, right? It's no different. It's no different for anyone who believes. But the thing of it is, is you have to step out first. See, the signs usually follow the preaching. They usually follow the preaching. I've only heard of a couple different times where someone got healed even before the word was preached. And, and it was shocking to that person. He told me, he's like, I couldn't believe it. You know, God started healing everyone. And I was saying, wait, wait, wait. I got to preach the word first. It, but God's all sovereign. He can heal people when he wants to, right? But let me tell you, church, it really, for the most part, we have to step out and preach the word, and he will confirm the word. He will confirm the word. And to, you, to demonstrate the authority of the king is a great way to advance the kingdom in a violent world. And, and just to let you know, demonstrating the authority, think about those who had authority in the kingdom. Think about the Bible uh, People in the Bible from the past, Moses, he spoke with authority, even though he, he didn't think he was a very good speaker. What he said happened, right? Because God backed him up. You know, what, you know look, at, look at the others in the Bible that spoke with authority. Elijah spoke with authority. He called down fire from heaven, burned up people. Yeah. <laughs> and, and there's others that John the Baptist spoke with authority. Who told you, you brood of vipers, to come out here? Who told you to repent? You know, that's no way to really build a church, is it? That's not too seeker-friendly, is it? No. It, if you demonstrate the authority of the king and walk in the authority in the appropriate way, God will advance his kingdom through you. It will happen. Now, the fifth thing is, is to preach in the persecution. Preach in the persecution. Acts 8.1, it says, A great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem, and all the believers except for the apostles were scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria. Some devout men came to and buried Stephen with great mourning. But Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women, to throw them into prison. But the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus 
wherever they went. Now think about that. Now why does God allow the enemy to persecute the church? You know, I don't know. I'm not sure. But I do know whatever the devil does, God can turn it around for the good. Amen. He can. And he will. And he does. He can use it to get us out of our comfort zone. Persecution can do that. Guess what, church? American church, we're starting to see just a little sliver of what it may look like. Just a little baby sliver. You know, it starts this way and it'll keep rolling if we don't stand up and, and take, the, take the word to the streets and get out. He can use it to get us out of our comfort zone and he can use it to wake the church up and to get, you know, just give the church a little kick in the rear, a check from behind, a push from behind to get moving. Persecution is always intended by the devil to stop the momentum of the church. But it leads, it tends to have the opposite effect, if you've noticed. You know, it's mu much like jujitsu. Ju you, know, you know, that technique where the technique manipulates uh, the attacking opponent's force against himself? It's like God's just using that and just like, whoop, you know? And that's what persecution uh, does. And it, it'll, it'll fire us up as a church. I know there's, there's the Chinese church is praying that the American church will begin to uh, uh, suffer some persecution. And they're praying that for our benefit, believe it or not. Now, persecution is also like a little camper trying to put out a lantern fire in a dry forest. Have you ever done something like that? Put out an oil fire or a kerosene fire? You know, you start putting it out, you start stomping. Whew, little fire goes here. Whew. Little fire goes there, catches fire over there. Whew. The more you stop it, the more you hit it, the more you try to stop it out, guess what? Fire sparks keep flying out and just keep burning another spot, another spot, another spot. That's what persecution does. And when people are filled with the oil, their lamps are filled with the oil and their, their wick is lit for the kingdom of God, guess what? The church will always keep advancing against the gates of hell when it's being persecuted. See, Jesus said he'll, he was going to build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Amen. You know something about that? You have to advance up to the gates of hell to, to, uh, for hell not to prevail, the gates not to prevail against the church. And that's what we do. We march right up to the gates of hell. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. The church is eternal. It's eternal. It's not going away, but the enemy is. The enemy is. So a great way to advance the kingdom of God in a violent world really is to preach in the midst of persecution. Use it to your own benefit. Number six is make prayer and fasting the new normal. You know, Matthew 6, 10 Jesus says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's from what we call the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're, we're praying, we're supposed to pray a, something like a template like that to the Father who's in heaven. And Jesus told us how to pray. We pray his kingdom come to earth, not the other way around. You ever notice that? Sometimes we, we get too heavenly minded that we're not even really thinking about praying the kingdom down here on this earth. And sometimes we think of the kingdom, well, that's the future kingdom when Jesus sets up his, his throne in Jerusalem. Well, that's, that's in the future, yeah, but his kingdom is now. It's happening now. It's present now. He's king now. And, and so with that, it means that prayer is essential in advancing his kingdom. It, advancing his kingdom here. Anna the prophet, remember who she was? She was that widow who was in the temple night and day. She was praying and fasting in the temple for the kingdom to come. Yeah. And guess what happened? The king came. Hallelujah. He came in. She got to see the king before she went and, and, and passed away. She got to see the king himself. King Jesus even prayed 
He was very intentional about praying. He prayed in a certain place. He had a certain time. And he, he would pray every day. And, and the, uh, the disciples really wanted to, they asked him, how, how, teach us to pray. Not teach us how to pray. Just teach us to pray like you pray. And he did. But he'd pray all night. He prayed all night just to pick out those 12 guys. Think about that. That's how bad they were. No. He, he, had, he had to pray. He had to pray and p- to pick out. Just think about that. Every, every big decision you make, you should be praying. Every decision, you, you, you know, wherever it is, if it's a big decision, that was a big decision, you need to be praying. Praying is a key to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit also. After Jesus ascended, the believers were constantly in prayer. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit filled up 120 believers because they were praying, right? And what happened? The kingdom of God advanced in a violent world at the time, and 3,000 people came into the kingdom in one day. Now, prayer is also an essential weapon, but prayer is is communication with God. You're you're not only talking to God, but you're also listening to God. So prayer is a two-way communication. And and prayer helps you put the whole armor of God on. You know, when it talks about the armor of God in the the Bible, you got to put the whole armor of God on. What what are we talking about? We're talking, hey, prayer is in there. Prayer, you don't, you know, you don't miss prayer. Prayer will help you put that armor of God on. Prayer helps you use the sword of the Spirit. Prayer will help you to use the Bible in the appropriate way. The Holy Spirit will give you scripture. If, you, if you've read it before, if, you, if you've been in your Bible, he will bring it to your remembrance. If you're not in it, how can you remember it? But prayer, just talking to the Holy Spirit, asking the Holy Spirit, show me what that means. Show me what to do. He'll usually bring up a scripture or he'll just speak, speak it right out plain to you. Don't go with him. Don't go with her. Prayer helps you use the sword of the spirit. Prayer helps you use other weapons like your spiritual gifts. Consider those weapons, by the way. They are weapons of warfare because they're spiritual gifts, but they're weapons. And think about that. When you're using your spiritual gifts, you don't want to, it's not a weapon against somebody. It's not, your enemy is not people. Your enemy is the devil. But God's given you that gift so you can use it to advance the kingdom. Praying in the Spirit also will build you up. If you want to step it up a notch, then you mix prayer with worship. After all, prayer really is worship. The beginning of the Lord's Prayer is all about worshiping God. You know, it's all about who He is and praising who He is and, and, and just, you know, worshiping Him. And then you're bringing it, and that's, that's part of prayer too. But if you mix prayer with worship and fasting, then look out. You got dynamite on your hands. You got, you got something big that's going to happen. Acts 13, 2 and 3 says, On the day as these men, one day, the day as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Dedicate Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So after more prayer and fasting, <laughs> fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on, on them and sent them on their way. Now, you notice that? They, they, had to, they had to pray and fast again. They're like, hey, w- maybe we're not right. Maybe we're not ready here. And they prayed and fast again just to lay hands on them and send them out. But the kingdom of God isn't all about eating and drinking. It's about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, right? The kingdom is spiritual. And praying and fasting are spiritual acts, but they're also physical. You know, after all, being sent on your way is physical, right? Praying with your mouth is physical. Sometimes you've got to fight your sleep to pray. The disciples did in the Garden of Gethsemane. And, and so it's, it can be physical, but it's spiritual at the same time. See, where, where some people mess up, some get all, it's all about the physical, and they mess up. It's all about what they can do in their own hands and works and all that, and they mess up. And then some Christians, they're just praying, and that's it. Well, there comes a time where God says, oh, you're, I, you prayed enough. I'm going to send you out. Now's the time to go do something. You know, you, you prayed. I've, I've taken care of it. 
now go. I remember our, our, our mission trip to Cuba, we went out and it was hot and we went where people lived. And we walked all around and stuff and, and uh, it, it could be, it, it was physical. It got physical for, for some. It was hot, it was uphill, downhill, whatever. And, and it was physical. But what was happening, there was something happening in the spiritual also. People that are spiritual are not afraid to step out in the physical. That's what I'm getting at. You can't be spiritual and not, and not step out in the physical. You can't be spiritually minded the way God wants you to be and neglect what you need to do in the physical sense. Okay? You, you, can, you can be spiritual all you want, but if you don't do anything when God tells you to go, then it doesn't matter. And what? God's already told us, go. You don't have to wait for him to say go. That, that's the Great Commission. Go. Go out and preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. And, and so we're vessels that God will use to advance his kingdom if we're both spiritual and physical and just putting those two together. Praying. In fa I mean, fasting, look, yeah, that's physical too. You're fasting. You're not eating. <laughs> you, you're fasting, man. That's physical. Your, your stomach's growling, right? And, and you say, oh, no, no. I'm going to, uh-uh, flesh, you got to stay down. I'm, I'm fasting. I, I want to I get God's attention in a faster way. And, and so fasting. So if you really want to advance the kingdom of God in a violent world, start praying and fasting as the new norm. And coming up in, in September, we're going to go into a fast for the, for the month of September. We'll have some books here next week and to pass out. And we're going to go into a prayer and fasting time. And you get to pick out your fast, whatever. Uh, but we'll have different prayers and, and to, to pray for. This coming fall is really something big may happen. And the church really needs to be praying and fasting before it comes on us. We have to be ready. The seventh thing is to stay strong in your faith. Acts 11.24 says, Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and strong in faith, and many people were brought to the Lord. Now, people of faith bring people to the Lord. That's what happens. So if you're faithful, you're going to be fruitful. Why? Because you're going to be connected to the vine, right? You're going to be connected to the life-giving source uh, of, of God. And you're going to, when you're faithful, you're going to be fruitful. And there's going to be fruit that comes from you. You might not see it right away, but somewhere down the line, there'll be fruit. And people will come to the Lord. They'll come into the kingdom because of you. So how can you stay strong in the faith? Well, right there in that scripture, stay filled with the Holy Spirit. Stay filled. Well, the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit will help you to be strong and to be a strong witness to others. He'll give you power that you didn't think you had. You know, and part of that being a good witness, to be a witness to others is being, living out your life as a, in a good way, as an example to show somebody. And you can do that just by not cursing. You know, the Holy Spirit will take that right away if you're really saved. If you're really giving to yourself to the king and you're in the kingdom, guess what? God doesn't want you cursing. Why? Because it's, it's not a good witness. It's a bad witness, and it won't advance the kingdom. You, know, you, you, can, be, you can forcefully advance the kingdom without using curse words. Trust me. <laughs> it, there's other things. You know, it, the Lord will, will show you and direct you and guide you. Faith is a key component. Faith is a key component uh, that determines the success of advancing the kingdom. Sometimes it can be a lack of faith that people have. Uh, Jesus, he could hardly do anything, any miracles or anything supernatural in his hometown, you know, uh, except for heal a few people. Think about that. Think about that. Jesus himself could only heal a few people in his hometown because of their faith. Oral Roberts was a man strong of faith. Uh, he, he was a man of God. He had strong faith. He had a healing ministry. The Lord did uh, miraculous things through his healing ministry. 
It, but there were doubters, there were critics, and, and they'd always try to catch them saying something wrong and you know, doing something wrong. And, and one time somebody asked them, well, what do you do when you pray for someone and they don't get healed? And you know what Oral Roberts said? He just says, well, I just move on to the next person and start praying. <laughs> it's just as simple as that. So if you pray for somebody and you don't see them get healed right away, hey, don't worry about it. They might get healed when you're gone. You know, God might choose a different time to heal them instead of while you're right there. And you know what? You can't, get your, you can't beat yourself up if you pray for somebody and they don't get healed. You know, the reason I'm here today is because you prayed for me. I, I, I'm serious. I couldn't walk. I mean, I was having a hard time. That was the worst time I've had with, with my back. And, and you guys prayed me into the pulpit. That's what you did. <clears throat> Now, Jesus was amazed a couple times. A couple times, if you read the gospel, you'll see that Jesus was amazed. He was amazed one time for a lack of faith in people in his hometown. He was amazed by the lack of faith. <laughs> you know, you can, you can imagine that. That is just amazing. I can't believe that you, you guys have so little faith. And you hear him say it a few times to his own disciples. And then there was another time he was amazed at great faith of where it came from. It was from a Roman centurion. Amen. You know, who is he? He's a man of authority. See, they kind of go together. You know, when you walk in the authority of the kingdom, there is, there is stronger faith. And a Roman centurion had to be an example to those Jewish people who were following Jesus and they couldn't believe it. You know, Jesus said, I, I haven't seen this great a faith in all of Israel. Amen. Imagine how they felt when they heard him say that. And he, he knew, hey, Jesus said, he's got, he's got the authority. He said he's healed. He's healed. Okay. Thank you. I've got to be on my way. I gotta, I'm a man of authority. I've got people to, to, to delegate stuff to. But that's how the kingdom advances. Faith is the confidence uh, uh, that what we hope for will actually happen. And that's Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the confidence that we hope for will actually happen. And it gives us assurance about things we cannot see. See, it takes faith to heal the sick. You know, you, you can't, you're, you're not, you don't see people healing most of the time right in front of you when you're praying for them. But it takes faith to heal the sick. It takes faith to cast out devils. You know, devils don't, they don't want to go out right away. And then, you, you, you know, if you start doubting about your authority in Christ, well, guess what? It might take a little bit longer. But it takes faith to cast out devils. It takes faith to operate in the kingdom of God. It takes faith to enter into the kingdom and continue to live in the kingdom of God. That's why we've got to have strong faith. The last thing is, number eight, is exalt Jesus as king. Exalt Jesus as king. Luke 19.38 says, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Now think about that. You know, exalt Jesus as king. You, we can't be silent about Jesus in the kingdom. We can't be silent when it comes to the king of glory. You just can't. You can't be silent. That's when Jesus came into Jerusalem, the triumphal entry, he came in riding a donkey, and he was king. And, and back in those days, there was a reason why the king rode a donkey. It was to say, I'm coming in peace. If he rode a horse, that meant he's coming for war. Well, guess what? Jesus is riding the next time he comes. He's riding a, a white horse, isn't he? Well, that day he was coming on a donkey, and he was bringing peace in. But the, the Pharisees didn't like it. They, th there's always going to be people that want you to be silent. Don't be silent when it comes to the king of glory. Even when people try to keep you quiet 
Oh, you shouldn't be singing. You shouldn't be singing. You shouldn't be worshiping. You shouldn't be worshiping. We can't have that. Don't let them silence you. Proclaim Jesus as king loud enough that even a game seven crowd can't over, overpower your voice. You got to exalt Jesus in every way. Let's stand. Proclaim Jesus. Now, a lot of things are happening these days. We're seeing a lot of uh, violence. Violent people are attacking. But the kingdom of heaven is being forcefully advanced. And the Lord wants, wants people, wants his people, citizens, ambassadors, kings and priests to take and advance the kingdom. And I'm not talking about physically in, in a sense where you just overpower people. I'm talking about the whole thing, especially on the spiritual side. But it takes us to go out, proclaim Jesus as king out loud in, in the public. That's where it starts. And, and really, that's where it starts to enter the kingdom of God. You, you, have, to, you have to repent of your sins and then Proclaim that Jesus is Lord, that he is king, and that God raised him from the dead after three days. I mean, think about that. All for you. So let's just raise our hands up to the Lord. And let's just proclaim. And I'll just lead us, but you can just, you use your own voice. And you don't have to repeat after me, but just just proclaim, Jesus, I proclaim you king. Jesus, I'm gonna, I, I want to be in your kingdom. And, and Lord, I want to be in your kingdom for all of the days of my life. Even after this body is done, I want to be in your kingdom. And so, Lord, I thank you that your kingdom is all the power, all the glory, and it lasts forever and ever, Lord. And your kingship, your rule will last forever. It's eternal. And I thank you, and I give you praise for that, Lord. And Lord, I want to serve you all my days and to be, be a representation of your kingdom right here on earth, Lord. Use me, work through me, Lord. Whatever you want me to do to advance the kingdom, let me know, Lord. I want to partner with you. I want to advance the kingdom, even in a violent world, in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. All right. Well, praise God. You go out and represent the kingdom and keep advancing the kingdom of God. And I want to just bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Be blessed. Have a great day.